Liz Truss. <laughs> Full name Lizard Trust, she's a former think tanker, Lord Chancellor, and Secretary of State for Justice of all things. She's an expert on fat pigs, and I don't just say that because she's worked with Boris Johnson. I can't help but feel like I'm missing something from her resume, but I'm sure whatever it is was fleeting and barely impacted the country at all. Today, we're going to take a look at where she came from, where she's going to, then we'll finish by Prime Minister. That was it. She was also Prime Minister. Sorry. As I said, we're going to take a look at the life and times of Lizzie Pork Market's Truss, and maybe we'll find out why, despite her experience at the highest level of politics, she continues to be such a weapons-grade fucking prat. Liz was born in Oxford in 1975. Father was a university lecturer, and mother was a nurse and teacher. After some moving around, including a brief spell in Poland and Canada, Liz and her parents settled in Leeds. She's described her parents as being left-wing, and her father was part of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Little did he know that his own daughter would later become the biggest weapon of them all. After attending Roundhay School, and despite her parents wanting her to study at Cambridge University, Liz chose instead to go to Oxford. In the biography Out of the Blue, authors Harry Cole and James Seal call this a bout of teenage rebellion, because if there's one thing that comes to mind when I think of teenage rebelliousness, it's attending the UK's most prestigious university. While at Oxford, she studied, drumroll please, philosophy, politics, and economics. This puts her in a similar vein to David Cameron, Matt Hancock, Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt, and, jump scare warning, Anne Widdicombe. What the fuck? While she was at uni, she was actually a member of the Liberal Democrat Youth and Students Committee. Here she is, look, advocating for a referendum on abolishing the monarchy, being funny and charming if a bit mental. The good news is that she has managed to hang on to at least one of those characteristics. The bad news is that she's not funny or charming. Interestingly enough, this is where she met a man named Mark Littlewood, whom you may recognise from my previous video about think tanks. He was also studying philosophy, politics and economics, and was also a Liberal Democrat, and went on to be the director at the Institute for Economic Affairs, a think tank that championed the mini-budget released under Truss that crashed the economy. You know, spoiler warning. By the time she had left Oxford, however, she had become a card-carrying member of the Conservative Party. She left uni in 1996 and went to work for a small oil and gas startup called Shell. In her time before becoming an MP, she became a chartered management accountant. She became the economic director of Cable and Wireless, and went on to become the deputy director of the right-wing think tank Reform. Of all my complaints about Liz, and I mean this honestly, it's clear that she is academically gifted. I say this because I think it's important to point out that just because you're good at maths or history or economics, it doesn't mean that you can't be a relentlessly thick dickhead in practice. In 2001, she was selected to run as the Conservative candidate in the Labour safe seat of Hemsworth. No, not that one. Yes, that one. She wasn't successful, and October 2009 was when she was selected to be the Conservative candidate for South West Norfolk. This is where she hit a bit of a bump in the road, with the road being Conservative MP Mark Field, and the bump being his cock. See, back in 2004, he was assigned to help her achieve her goals of becoming a Conservative politician. The problem is that they started canoodling. You know, cleaning the cobwebs with the old womb broom. You know, crashing the custard truck. Doing squat thrusts in the cucumber patch. Shagging. That's what I mean. They were having sex. Of course, with them both being married, it was all a bit of a scandal. As a result, Mark Fields' wife got a divorce, and the Conservative members kicked up a bit of a stink about the fact that they weren't already aware of this before they voted for her to be their representative. Truth be told, they were already a bit testy after Liz was parachuted into their constituency to give her the chance of getting into office. A motion to deselect her as a candidate was put forward, but it was defeated. In the 2010 general election, Liz was finally elected as an MP with 48% of the vote. I know this result seems like an endorsement of her as a person, but South West Norfolk is, or at least was, one of the safest Conservative seats in the country. It's consistently been held by a Conservative MP since 1964. Now, let's contextualise her entry into government a bit. In 2010, despite the Conservatives not winning a majority, they saw 148 brand spanking new MPs into Parliament. This was seen as a net good for the party, and introducing some younger blood would only help to modernise it. 
Liz was one of the MPs introduced during that time, along with the likes of professional forehead grower Dominic Raab, the haunted pencil we know as Jacob Rees-Mogg, and the woman that would later revolutionise how we abuse foreigners, Pretty Patel. Point being, there were high hopes for this intake of Tories, and Liz was one of those earmarked for bigger things by the then Prime Minister, David Cameron. She started off as a backbencher for two years, and in that time, kept herself quite busy. In 2011, she co-authored a book called After the Coalition. Her co-authors include Pretty Patel, Quasi Kwarteng, and Dominic Raab, and the book was the usual free-market fundamentalism tripe that you'd expect to see from this gaggle of brain cell deficient twats. That same year, she co-founded the Free Enterprise Group, you can think of them as basically the Dementors to Margaret Thatcher's Voldemort, and in September 2012, she was one of many, many co-authors of the book called Britannia Unchained. Now, we've spoken about this a couple of times in previous videos, and it's a great example of how you don't necessarily have to have red skin and horns to show the world that you relish in the suffering of starving children. Once again, her co-authors include Dominic Raab, Pretty Patel, and Quasi Kwarteng. If you're noticing a theme here, well, it's because there's a theme here. Liz went on to become the Under Secretary of State for Education, then Secretary of State for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs by 2014. Makes sense, I suppose. I mean, I'm not sure about the environment or food, but her experience with affairs is virtually unparalleled. In 2016, she was appointed by Theresa May to become the first female Lord Chancellor in British history. She was also appointed as Secretary of State for Justice at the same time, so a tough gig. An especially tough gig considering she has no understanding of the legal system beyond watching reruns of Judge Rinder on ITV. In fact, she was Lord Chancellor when the Daily Mail ran with the now infamous front cover branding three High Court judges enemies of the people for insisting that Brexit be done, you know, legally. This is important because the whole point of her professional existence at that time was to defend the judiciary from being dragged into political fuckery. The judges involved had to seek out police advice on how to protect themselves because they had people approach them in person and tell them that they were enemies of the people. This will come as no surprise, but Liz Truss handled it like a complete fucking smackhead. Here's how this formula should work. Some pigeon fucker writes a dog shit article about your team, you immediately go to bat for them and say it's a load of thick bollocks, and that's it. What actually happened is that some pigeon fucker wrote a dog shit article about Liz's team, she said fuck all about it for a couple of days, and when her team called her out publicly for being a complete twat, she publishes a complete nothing burger response. The stupidity of which is only eclipsed by the fact that she also publicly announced that she wouldn't outright condemn what was written in case she'd be seen as attacking the free press. Because apparently telling Paul Dacre to fuck off is worse than protecting High Court justices for insisting that we follow the law. Okay, so 2017 ticks over. Theresa May calls a general election to try and gain a little bit of spending power in light of Brexit, but instead loses seats to Labour. It was all a bit of a fuck up for the Conservatives, and Liz wasn't left unscathed as she was demoted to Chief Secretary to the Treasury after May's reshuffle. Not exactly backbench work, but not Justice Secretary either, you know? 2019, Theresa May resigns as Prime Minister the country I love, and Liz starts courting the idea of running for leadership. She ultimately works out that nobody really knows who she is, and those that do know her think she's weird as fuck, so she endorses Boris Johnson for leadership while putting together a plan to build her own public profile. Flash forward to 2022, and Boris Johnson is booted out faster than you could say I'm a smelly frog-faced cunt that likes to spit in the face of people that died during lockdown, and another leadership race begins. The usual bunch of cunts apply, and it's looking good for a boring, seatbelt repellent douche called Rishi Sunak. He's won all five rounds of the MP's votes, and by quite a large margin, but the final vote, held by party members rather than MPs, voted in Liz Truss as our new Prime Minister. She took the hard-fought victory with grace and decorum, dispelling any rumours of a snap election and saying, quote, I know that our beliefs will resonate with the British people. The people of Britain responded with eye rolls and scepticism. The Daily Star responded by starting a live stream of a lettuce, and the Queen responded by instantly dying. That's right, just two days into her famously long and storied tenure, Queen Elizabeth II died after over 70 years reigning over us filthy serfs. As the British people mourned the loss as only we know how by queuing, Liz was holed up in Downing Street with her Chancellor Quasi Kwarteng trying to piece together an emergency mini-budget to save the country. 
Now, before we get on to the mini-budget, let me set the stage a bit. It's September 2022. Inflation was through the roof. Energy costs were forcing the most vulnerable and our elderly to choose between keeping warm and keeping fed. The mismanagement of COVID contracts saw us lose tens of billions of pounds to conservative donors and sycophants that left our NHS high and dry. Public sentiment towards politicians was at an all-time low, as leaks showed our ministers partying and breaking lockdown rules as people up and down the country lost their lives. To top it all off, Russia invaded Ukraine in February, which only served to add fuel to the rapidly burning fiscal fire. Now, what I mean to say is that there was a real pressure on her to start turning the dial back towards leading a government that was accountable, financially literate, and would protect working class families that were falling below the breadline. So what did she do? Well, on the 23rd of September, her Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, announced that they would be cutting income tax by 1%. Okay, well, that's a tax cut. And they would also abolish the 45% income tax band, which is another tax cut. They would cut universal credit, which is an austerity measure that would impact the poorest and least able in the country. Liz also pledged to reduce national insurance by 1.25%, which is another tax cut. They would also scrap the proposed 6% increase to corporation tax, which is a tax cut. In total, they announced £45 billion in completely unfunded tax cuts, the bulk of which was being handed to the richest people in the country. The icing on the cake here is that the Office for Budget Responsibility, which is exactly what it sounds like it is, didn't get to see the budget beforehand to produce its own independent forecast. As a result, the pound instantly slumped to a 37-year low. The average fixed-term two-year mortgage went from interest rates of 3.66% to 5.24%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it meant an increase in the several hundreds of pounds per month for your average homeowner. Pretty much every interest rate in every sector was going up and down like Tower Bridge. The point is, I'm pretty sure anybody in the UK could have chugged a gallon of alphabetty spaghetti and shat something more coherent. The pressure from MPs, the public, the Bank of England, international investors, trading partners was crushing. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, said it was shit. Joe Biden said it was shit, and this was back when he could string a sentence together without shitting his diapers. The Labour Party joined forces with Tory MPs like Michael Gove and Grant Shapps to condemn the budget. And the fact that they purposefully prevented independent verifications made pretty much every investor in anything pull out faster than Johnny Sins. Now, Liz claims that she didn't have the budget reviewed because she didn't have time to wait for the OBR forecast, but the OBR wrote that they would have been in a position to produce a forecast by the 23rd, the day they announced the budget. The reality is that Liz Truss simply assumed they wouldn't have the time, so she just didn't ask. So the UK goes into meltdown. On October 3rd, they U-turned on their plan to scrap the top rate of income tax. When that failed to quell the shitstorm, Liz fired Kwasi Kwarteng, her long-term friend, fellow MP and co-author, in order to try and pin the blame on the donkey and salvage her own political career. She also announced that very day that they would also U-turn on their plans to reduce corporation tax. Now, it's worth remembering that even though they didn't actually get the chance to implement the changes they'd proposed, this mini-budget still cost us an estimated £30 billion that would need to be made up. Now, basically, the moment the mini-budget was announced, every political pundit was taking bets on whether or not Liz would be Prime Minister by the end of the year. On October 14th, the Daily Star began live-streaming a lettuce with a fucking wig on it, which was a great gag, by the way, as the world pondered which would last longer, Liz the Lettuce or Liz the Prime Minister. That question was answered on the 20th of October 2022, when, on just her 50th day in office, she announced that she was resigning. She stepped down as the shortest-serving and the least popular Prime Minister in British history. The country rejoiced, the lettuce earned a moral victory at the very least, and this proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that she was about as loved by Britain as stingrays are by the Irwins. But this isn't where her story ends. We all know that she was succeeded by the unelected pocket politician Rishi Sunak. I'm a cunt oh. addict. Oh, a total cunt addict. addict. And while she might have slipped off the radar for the most of us, Liz continued to be an insane dickhead behind the scenes. 
First off, despite spending less time in office than a dry aged steak, she still chucked 11 people into the House of Lords in her resignation honours. They were basically all aides, and by that I mean the disease. Both Labour and the Lib Dems called on Rishi Sunak to block the list given that there are probably spiders that have spent more time in number 10 than her, but Rishi Sunak didn't, and responded instead with meow. Because he's a fucking pussy. So she crawls back to southwest Norfolk. In September 2023, she launches her memoirs about her time as a Prime Minister, named 10 Years to Save the West. The book is 300 and 320 pages! Fuck me, that's like six and a half pages per day in office. I'm not going to cover it all here because, to put it politely, I'd rather get pegged by an unshowered Amy Schumer than subject myself to a single word uttered into existence by this fucking idiot. It was, however, universally panned as being a completely unrelenting crock of cat shit though, so there's that, I suppose. In February of this year, she pops her head up to co-launch a group called Popular Conservatism, or Popcon if you're a bellend. The group is directed by Mark Littlewood. We spoke about him earlier as the former director of the IEA and longtime supporter of Liz Truss. Associates of the group include Pretty Patel, Lee Anderson, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Remember I said there's a theme here? It's because there's a theme here. Their goal, according to their website at least, is to teach the public and MPs about the benefits of Brexit. Because eight years after the vote, Brexit supporting MPs still need to be told what the benefits are, and that doesn't worry me at all. Not one bit. Unfortunately for Liz, the writing was on the wall. That writing just so happened to say, fuck off, everyone thinks you're a massive twat, and no better was this sentiment expressed than in the 2024 general election. See, the Conservative Party was up shit creek sans paddle, and even prominent, long-serving cabinet members were worried about retaining their otherwise historically safe seats. Despite Penny Morden losing her seat, and Jacob Rees-Mogg losing his seat, and Grant Shapps losing its seat, perhaps the biggest surprise came when Liz Truss lost hers. Here's how it goes down. The votes are cast and counted, and everybody's ready to kick off, but Liz is still yet to be seen. She rocks up to the stage just seconds before they make the announcement that she's just become the first former Prime Minister to lose their seat since 1935. She lost to Labour's Terry Jeremy by 630 votes, which is a tiny margin to lose on, but it was a seismic departure from her 26,000 vote majority back in 2019. She doesn't give a speech. She steps off the stage, has a natter to a few people, then heads over to a BBC reporter to say this. Now, these aren't her exact words, but I'll put the report up on the screen now so you know I'm not totally misrepresenting what this complete dick for brain said out loud to another human being. She says, I think we just haven't delivered on what the people want. We haven't kept taxes low, and we haven't controlled immigration. I know I was a member of the cabinet for a long time and also was the prime minister, but we just haven't been able to take on what the Labour Party had left us back in 2010. Now, she might as well have just shat in her hands and started blowing bubbles with it for all the sense she was making, and everyone knew it. She then walks out of the building, hops into her car, and fucks all the way off. And it was fantastic. And that's pretty much it. If there's one thing we can all learn from Liz Truss, it's that you don't necessarily have to carry a cauldron and broomstick to be a complete she-witch from hell. She's the result of a political system that favours pedigree and schooling over integrity expertise, and a commitment to public service. That sounds wanky, I know, but it's true. The reason I make these videos is, you know, partly to call people cunts for my own amusement, but it's also to show people that when you look back at how these guys came to power, it's about as surprising as finding a fedora-wearing virgin at a My Chemical Romance concert. And what we all need to understand is that if they walk like a cunt, and talk like a cunt, and crash the economy like a cunt, then the chances are you're looking at a cunt. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please do like and subscribe. It really helps. A big old thank you to my grandiose and superlative supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so from just £1 a month. The link is in the description. Love you. Bye bye.